Okay, continuing on with our integrated pest management conversation, we're going to be looking at the final steps in the IPM process. We're going to review steps three, four, five, and six, monitoring, setting an action threshold, implementing control measures, and what to do afterward. We don't need to spend too much time in detail today talking about those steps, but we will dive deeper in the coming weeks to explain more as we go. Starting with step three, we're going to be selective in our strategies. We're going to be tailoring everything we do according to decisions we arrived at in the previous uh, step. Basically, if we have a solid identification, then the monitoring, the decision-making, and the controlling all become very specific, context-based, and targeted approaches. And so after you do step two, it will look different every time because you're, you're narrowing down your range of possibilities to meet the appropriate control method for that pest. But let's take a look at step three, which is monitoring and assessing the damage. So here we see some activities taking place. We have a person in a field with a net going out and uh, following a, a predetermined path and using a specified methodology to try to collect live specimens, presumably of some insect pests. In the middle, we have uh, a trap of some sort that is uh, specially designed to attract a certain insect and probably uh, maybe a little bit of a, a scent a, a, attached to it so that that uh, target organism is attracted in. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we have uh, some paper with a sticky substance covering it. And you can see it has a grid. The grid is designed to very easily give you uh, a percentage. So you can uh, make decisions, how many bugs stick to the paper and how many are in each of the squares. And you can use that to help you decide and actually monitor over time. The aim of monitoring and assessing damage is to detect the problem before they become obvious. You want to notice something's happening before you've lost everything. That's the idea. In order to detect the problems before they become obvious, you want to check the landscape regularly and systematically. How often you should uh, check and what methods you should use they're gonna vary with each context, with each landscape, the time of the year and the pest you're looking for and the overall goal, but it should be regular, consistent, and you should have a process that's repeatable or systematic. Along those lines, you should use a pattern of inspection and collect information the same way every time. So follow the same path, look at the same plants, make the same notes and use the same tools and methods to try to get an accurate picture over time. You're comparing last time to this time and you'll be comparing next inspection to the previous as well. So you wanna create a good baseline of data with which to discover changing patterns against. And you need to write this down or have it uh, recorded in some fashion. It can be very simple, a piece of paper on a clipboard, and every time you do your little inspection, you make a note of something. Or it can be uh, quite sophisticated and uh, electronic, so it can be easily shared. You want to record the date, the specific location, the host plant, the presence or absence of pests, or the actual count of pest abundance, a description of your procedures, the name of the inspector, and anything else that you think may be relevant to monitoring. Of course, if you're in a high level uh, farm where there's a lot of money on the line, you will probably have an incentive to have much more complex monitoring. But if you're in a small scale residential garden, landscape, 
working for yourself or for a client. It could be something much more simple. Uh, we want to match the complexity to the risk and to the need. So next, we'll take a look at how to set an action threshold, some of the thought process behind that step. Now recall that an action threshold is a level of pest damage above which you will decide to implement control methods. And so what this means is you don't do something if you just have one. If one bug is not gonna be a problem, you accept and tolerate the one bug. And what you do in step number four is you try to decide at what point must we intervene? This is where that knowledge of population dynamics becomes important. Let's take a look at the graph on the left-hand side. We have a line that represents the number of pests or the size of the population. And then we're comparing that over time. So we are going to first take a look at the red line. And this is our estimated pest population if nothing is done. Say you have a beautiful garden full of delicious vegetables and you just planted it. It's now a perfect environment to feed some kind of pest. Over time, the number of pests will increase. Remember that it will increase up to a point that we call the carrying capacity. And so it will level off eventually. However, the question is, is letting it level off appropriate for this circumstance? Well, in this case, some time has been spent thinking about the economics of this hypothetical farm. They've decided on a limit, a total number of pests that will start to cause economic damage to the business. Now we could take that same economic concept and apply it to a, a horticultural setting that's not really profit oriented. And we could think about the replacement cost of the plant or uh, if the plant is irreplaceable, uh, trying to hang on to or lose that plant. There's a whole host of things to consider. But in particular, the EIL that you see listed is a predetermined number of pests that over time they have learned if they go higher than that, then the loss from the garden starts to cost more than the effort to control the pest. And so how much does it cost to control the pest? How much are you gonna lose? You use those numbers and that decision to come up with a limit. Now the line below the EIL, the economic injury level, it says ET. And in this case, ET stands for economic threshold. So the idea is if we know that the maximum number of pests we can tolerate is 10, we don't wanna get to 10. We need to do something before it gets to 10. So we can intervene at an earlier stage in the population's growth. This is what they call the economic threshold. And the idea is you need to think about how long will it take to control the population and how effective will that be? So you intervene at an economic threshold so that there's time for the population to be controlled, brought back down, and then you do nothing and you wait until it reaches that economic threshold again. So the blue dashed line is demonstrating the concept of keeping the pest population below an economic injury level by only implementing a control once the pest population surpasses the economic threshold. Notice it says time one, time two. Those are two times that you treat for pests in the cycle of this graph. So it doesn't mean you treat every single day. 
You only treat when it becomes a problem. Now, an example of that would be the image on the right-hand side, and this is more of an ornamental or horticultural setting. What we see on the right-hand side are aphids. Uh, aphids are a very common plant pest in the landscape, and uh, they may or may not cause significant damage. What we see in particular in this image, those bright yellow or orange aphids, they're commonly known as oleander aphids. And in particular, they are attracted to oleanders as well as milkweed. Milkweed is a common plant that is planted in order to help protect the monarch butterfly. Uh, the monarch butterfly uses this plant multiple times in its life cycle, but in particular, uh, it's a valuable food source for the larva, the caterpillars of the monarch. And so people plant milkweed in order to help out the monarchs. The aphids will move in and start eating the milkweed. And not too many other things eat milkweed besides these aphids and the monarch caterpillars because milkweed is toxic. And in particular for monarchs, that's a good thing. It's what makes them toxic to predators. So people see the bugs on the milkweed and they think, oh no, the bugs are going to eat all of the plant and leave nothing for the caterpillars. And while that is technically possible, in practice, what usually happens is that these aphids do not damage the plant significantly. What's more is they do not go to other plants. They will stay on the milkweed. And finally, these aphids are delicious food for ladybird beetles, otherwise known as ladybugs. Ladybugs are a good thing in the garden. So having milkweed and having the oleander aphids on the milkweed is actually, in some ways, a good thing. It allows for a safe food source for your predators, and you're reasonably protected from the aphids destroying the milkweed. The caterpillars should still have plenty of food. And we're in a situation where there's no need to act most of the time. You typically will stay below an economic injury level or below an action threshold. There's no need to do anything yet. However, each plant, each potential pest, and each garden setting brings up a different context and a need to create action thresholds in a, an independent, well thought out, context-based approach. Here are some tips for establishing IPM action thresholds. You want the threshold to be numerical or quantitative. So examples of types of thresholds you could use you could look at the percent of leaves damaged or infested. You could look at the number of pests dislodged per branch beet sample. So if you go along with a net or a stick and you kind of gently uh, beat the branches and you see how many pests fly off of those branches, that would be something you could measure and be quantitative numerical. You could look at the height of the weeds. At what point do the plant pests reach a certain level that they start to shade out or outcompete your desired plant? Or you could even count the number of complaints you get about a landscape. And so once you receive five complaints about an area, that's time to go and make sure you solve that problem. Notice that uh, it's not telling you exactly what the threshold should be but you need to decide for yourself when it's time to act. And it's a good idea to make sure it's a quantitative threshold. So that way you can inform others. And as a team, you could maintain a level standard that only acts when necessary. It can be easy to get emotional in some of these uh, situations and let our biases or our fears take over. But if we stay within this numerical threshold approach, we can just be very uh, systematic with how we do things. 
There's some other considerations you may want to include in your action thresholds. Uh, you may consider weather conditions. Only after uh, certain weather events will you do certain things. Um, you want to look at the history of problems in the landscape and think about past interventions and how you may want to adjust, modify, or borrow those same strategies for a new problem. You want to think about the stage of plant host. So you want to think about the life cycle of the pest, the life cycle of the plant, and you want to think about uh, when your plant is ready to be uh, inundated with your control measures. A good example of this could be uh, pre-flowering or post-flowering of an ornamental plant or even of a vegetable garden plant. You want to think about uh, not doing something before the plant uh, can tolerate the control measure. And you want to consider the presence of signs such as rodent burrows or droppings and use some of these other sorts of uh, conditions to help trigger control measures. So now let's talk about the fifth step in IPM, implementing pest control measures. This is the fun part. This is the juicy good stuff. This is what most people jump to right away. But for IPM professionals, we arrive at control measures as almost the final step in the process. We need good information and good decisions first. But once we know we need to do something, here's what we think about when implementing pest control measures. So we have a handy little diagram here that provides a hierarchy of control methods. And it may not be 100% intuitive. The pyramid is not meant to show you the best thing on the top and the worst thing on the bottom. It's quite the contrary. It's similar to the food pyramid in human nutrition. We want most of our energy to go toward the bottom of the pyramid. We want the majority of our management methods to be held within the lower levels of the pyramid. That's the bigger, more important foundation. And we want to only arrive at the top of the pyramid if and when we need to. And so as we climb the pyramid of management methods, we start to shift from a prevention strategy toward an intervention strategy. The interventions become more severe. Additionally, as we climb the pyramid, we begin to increase our toxicity. And toxicity in this respect is talking about potential for harm. Uh, we want to limit the potential for harm in any circumstance. And so let's describe each of these uh, steps in the management process. Cultural control, these are modifications of planting and maintenance activities that reduces or prevents pest problems. So things that we could include are how you design the irrigation and the plantings, selecting proper plants, irrigating properly, pruning practices implemented that are tailored toward pest reduction, and potentially soil aeration increasing the drainage, relieving compaction in order to help create healthy plants that can fight off pests on their own. When it comes to mechanical control, these are controls used by labor and non-pesticide materials, and it may include machinery to reduce the pest abundance directly. You could be hand pulling, you could be using hand tools such as a hoe. You can use fire or uh, torches to create a small flame and to eliminate weeds and pests that way. We can use mowers. We can apply mulch to the landscape, use a string trimmer to cut down weeds. 
We can apply copper bands and sticky material to the trunks of woody trees and shrubs in order to help disrupt any transportation of pests coming in to the plant. All of these would be considered mechanical control. And now we have physical control, which goes hand in hand with mechanical. But physical controls are typically also called environmental controls. You can suppress the pest population by altering the temperature, changing the light or the humidity slightly so that it encourages a reduction in plant pest populations. Examples of this would be thinning the plant canopy to allow a greater airflow and light into the center of the canopy, reducing the habitat of insect pests or uh, Im improving the plant's ability to fight off disease. You could also whitewash the tree trunk. And what we do in this circumstance is typically uh, painting the trunk of trees with a mixture of water and paint in order to provide some type of a sunscreen against the direct sunlight hitting the trunk, causing sunburn on the trunk of the tree. And in some instances, it also can help to prevent pests from entering into the tree in and of itself. But mainly we're trying to alter the environment uh, within the plant so that it no longer becomes such a susceptible host to pest populations. Biological control uses competitors or antagonists, pathogens, parasites, and predators to try to control pests. You can plant predator food and predator habitat in the landscape to attract your predators, natural enemies of pest populations. A good thing to do is to try to deter ants in the landscape, in particular the invasive Argentine ant, which is quite common in urban San Diego County. These ants will actually bring in other pests and the ants will use those pests to eat your plants. The ants rarely can eat your plant directly, but if they bring in aphids or mealybugs or scale, they will move that organism around from plant to plant in order to harvest the poop of that insect, uh, a sweet liquid that is typically referred to as honeydew, and it was brought in by the ants in the first place. So controlling for ants will help to reduce your pest population. And you could potentially release commercially available natural enemies. You can purchase ladybugs. You could purchase praying mantis at uh, nurseries and garden centers. As I said before, you want to do this with caution. Uh, you want to avoid introducing a new problem to the situation and everything you do could have unintended consequences. So I typically recommend you do this only after careful consideration, planning and research, and typically after you've got some permission from a governmental agency. So that way you know you're acting in accordance to what is gonna be safe on a broader scale. And then finally, we'll talk about the chemical control pesticides. These are chemicals that kill, prevent, or repel pests and reduce pest damage. You should always consider alternatives before using a pesticide. If you use a pesticide, it's good to combine or follow up its use with non-chemical control methods where feasible. So you can use other methods on the pyramid so that you need less chemical. And these are just a few strategies when it comes to selecting uh, chemicals for control. We will talk in future weeks about each of these elements in greater detail. Now, finally, we've got our last step, which is after action, you need to assess the effect of your management. It's not enough to go 
do a little spray and then go home and not even check to see if it worked. So it's important to keep collecting information. And this process keeps going around and around like the numbers on a clock. After we have implemented a pest control measure, we gather information, we assess the effect, and we use that to begin the process all over to adjust any uh, prevention measures, to further refine and confirm our identification, to continually monitor and assess the damage, and only act when it surpasses an action threshold. This is a process that is ongoing and continuous. And if you do it effectively, it does not need to take a significant amount of time, energy, money, or resources, but it can help to really save a landscape, save a plant, and keep a garden, farm, or horticultural setting in tip-top shape so that it is at its full health, beauty, and service to humanity and to the local ecosystem. So there we go, completing our introduction to the Integrated Pest Management Process, IPM process, and all of the steps that it entails. Each one of these steps, we can dive into deeper and learn much more about that subject, which we will do in the coming weeks. But overall, we're keeping this general approach in mind when we are confronted with plant pest problems in the landscape.